So a 20-year-old interview with the former president of Nintendo, Satoru Iwata, was recently posted on YouTube, and it proved one thing. That man was a prophet. This interview was sent to us by Adam Dory, the founder of Kikizo.com. It's a newly remastered tape filmed during E3 2004, which was 20 years ago this month. Crazy how the time flies. I don't even think I knew what E3 was at the time. I was just a nine-year-old kid probably playing Sonic Heroes on loop. But regardless, that was an exciting event, especially for Nintendo fans, because during that press conference, Reggie showed off the Nintendo DS, Iwata confirmed that they're working on a next-generation console, and they concluded the show with a BANGER trailer for The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. It wasn't called that at the time, but it was Twilight Princess. Now this Kikizo interview was filmed the day after that showing, and it was actually very hard to get any kind of interview with the president of Nintendo at the time, so this is a pretty unique kind of video. Here Iwata was asked about many different things, mostly the Nintendo DS as Nintendo was hot off the heels of that announcement, but there were parts of this interview that made me audibly gasp, because it really sounds like Iwata knew where the industry was going, and he wanted Nintendo to sort of veer away from that. Naturally, during this interview, he was asked about the next generation machine, which didn't even have a name yet or even the codename Revolution, but Iwata did say that, like the Nintendo DS, it would offer new forms of gameplay, and he was asked in the interview if he could elaborate on that. He said, of course, that he couldn't get into too much detail about the next generation console, but what he can say relating it to the DS is that the DS was a console that nobody could have expected. It'd be one thing if they released a handheld that was just a more powerful Game Boy Advance, while but with 10 times the CPU power and 20 times the amount of graphical polygons, but everyone would have seen that coming. No, that wasn't enough for them. They wanted to really surprise people and change how they play the games. That is a philosophy that I feel Nintendo has been holding onto for these past 20 years. Because as we know, after this interview, they announced the Nintendo Wii, and instead of pushing realistic HD graphics, it was all about the unique control scheme and ways to play. And who could have seen the Nintendo 3DS coming? Yeah, it was essentially a more powerful Nintendo DS, but they were like, no, 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 we got surprise people and give them a 3D slider. And then the Wii U was certainly unique. Yeah, it was also a more powerful Wii, but that tablet screen really did offer unique ways of play for better or for worse. And finally, there's the Switch, a handheld home console hybrid. Nintendo has really been ramping up the surprise factor with their consoles ever since this interview. So will they continue doing that with the Nintendo Switch 2? We'll talk about that later because we need to finish this interview as this next part made me go, whoa, this man can see the future or something. Let's get into it. He was asked how he sees the next generation battle taking place, to which he responds, quote, well, I really don't believe there will be a bright future waiting for the so-called next-generation consoles that Sony and Microsoft are advocating right now. As you may know, I was developing games until quite recently myself. I know how it is. And if any of these developers come to me and say, look, CPU or processing power is 10 times as much as today, graphic capability is 20 times, then I will say, that means more workload and slight difference with the current system in terms of letting people understand how improved the graphics shall be. So just as we have established with handheld gaming with the DS, just for example, if we cannot change the user interface of the current home console system and let consumers understand we are changing how the games are being played, then I am sorry but it must be difficult for anyone to persuade people to purchase so-called next-generation consoles. Wow. When I tell you that was my genuine reaction when I heard this in the video, that was my genuine reaction when I heard it in the video. Granted, I don't know if he's just talking about only the next generation consoles, the PS3 and 360, which haven't been announced yet at this point, or if he's also talking about the long, long term, the consoles after that, but man oh man, he hit the nail on the head. Let's pause this 2004 interview and fast forward 20 years to today. What's going on in the console space? Well, as of now, half of the PS4 user base has not yet upgraded to the PlayStation 5, which many can attribute to the fact that there's really not a lot of exclusive games on this console, as even the big PlayStation titles like God of War Ragnarok and Horizon Forbidden West have also released on PS4. So why even upgrade to a PS5 if you can still play most of those games on PS4, and now PC even? 
And now video games are just taking so long to make and they cost an ungodly amount of money. We're talking half a billion dollars, heck, maybe even close to that in some games. If you don't believe me, just listen to Xbox Game Studios chief Matt Booty, who said last year that most people need to realize games now take four to six years to make due to higher expectations and the level of fidelity that they can deliver just going up. Who possibly could have foreseen that pursuing powerful consoles only leads to longer development times and overblown development budgets. Iwata did. That's that, that's the whole point of the video. And it's great to hear this from him because he used to be a game developer. This man knew what would come from making more complex and graphically intensive games. The development times would just take longer. And that was not something Nintendo was interested in letting happen. He also knew that the difference just wouldn't really mean much. And that's the thing, right? You can keep making games look better and better and better, but you get to a point where the difference doesn't really matter anymore. You really don't see much of an improvement at a certain point. How many more polygons can you keep adding to make something look more real? It just doesn't make any sense. We're just at a point where graphical jumps between console generations are not really impressive anymore. And it seems like Iwata knew this back in 2004 and said, hey, we can't keep going this direction. We have to take a different direction. In fact, let's listen to what he said during that E3 2004 press conference. I suppose I could give you a list of our technical specs. I believe you'd like that, but I won't for a simple reason. They really don't matter. And in the long run, he was right. They really don't. In the end, it's the experiences and the games that matter, not the hardware itself. And you know, if any of this sounds familiar to you, that means you probably watched my video that I put out last weekend called Nintendo Was Right, in which I explained why Nintendo was right to not pursue the powerful consoles that PlayStation and Xbox were also putting out. So if you liked that video and you're currently liking this one, then subscribe to Game Explain and hit that notification bell. We come out with Nintendo videos like this every week. Anyway, back to why Nintendo wasn't making powerful consoles. Instead, this past generation, they put out the Nintendo Switch, a console that wound up being the third best-selling one of all time, and it helped make Nintendo the most profitable they have ever been in their entire history. And not to toot my own horn, but I think my point has been made even further this past week by the release of Senua Saga Hellblade 2 on Xbox Series X and PC. Full disclosure, I actually played this game to completion. I really enjoyed most of what I played of it. For one, yes, it is a beautiful game. I'm not gonna lie, I loved looking at the graphics of that game. It was really just pure eye candy. Still, is there anything else about Hellblade 2 that's impressive beyond its graphics? Yeah, there's an engaging story and great audio design, but as a game, it doesn't really have a lot of depth to it. There's a lot of very simple puzzles in there, you spend most of the game walking, and the combat is somehow even easier than the first game. And to think it presumably took the developers at Ninja Theory seven years to finish this game. Yeah, this sequel came out seven years after the first one. Granted, I'm sure the pandemic still slowed things down a bit, but I don't think the game would have come out that much sooner if there wasn't one. Now, even though I enjoyed most of Hellblade 2, that doesn't mean I'm down for more experiences like it, especially if it takes upwards of seven years to make just one of those games. No thank you, man. Give me games that don't look as graphically intensive. Give me games that focus more on the gameplay elements instead of the graphics. Basically, this Sonic meme. But I think Hellblade 2 is the perfect metaphor for what Nintendo was trying to avoid. Games that focus a lot more on the visual side of things, more so than the gameplay side of things. They want their gameplay to come first more than anything. That doesn't mean Nintendo games on their own don't look beautiful. Just look at the latest Zelda games, even Mario Odyssey. Also Metroid Prime Remastered Dude, which isn't made by Nintendo but Retro Studios. Still relevant though. Let's go back to something Iwata said in that interview. He does not believe there will be a bright future waiting for the so-called next generation consoles that Sony and Microsoft are advocating right now. 
if he was talking specifically about the PS3 and 360, those had pretty solid futures, I will say. They sold quite a lot, not as much as the Wii, but they still were successful in their own ways, but after that, that's when things started to go down a little. Like I said with the PS5, not many people are buying PS5s because they're so expensive and there's not that many exclusives on them. And you could partially thank the lack of exclusives for the fact that game development is just so long and expensive. The longer and more pricier game development gets, the less big games you're gonna have, and that's just the fact of it. The same thing applies to Xbox, which is doing worse this generation in terms of console sales and overall public opinion, laying off studios left and right for whatever reason. Right now, the future of AAA gaming seems grim, but Nintendo is leading the charge with the Nintendo Switch and hopefully the Nintendo Switch 2. Right now, the Switch is not a very powerful console, but it seems to get an exclusive game on average about once per month. At least that's how it's felt most years, there have been some exceptions, sure, but you can't argue that the amount of quality exclusives on the Switch is impressive, especially in this generation. So that actually brings me to something I'm a little concerned about. Awada, as we know, passed away in 2015, and I gotta wonder if Nintendo will hold on to this philosophy that Awada has put in place during his term. Former Nintendo developer Giles Goddard said during a Reddit AMA that ever since Awada passed away, Nintendo has been basically run by the shareholders. And that is something that's kinda scary. Shareholders only want one thing, and that is money, 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 money. Of course, Nintendo wants money too, but at the same time, Awada brought a sort of different perspective into the ring with some creative and imaginative ideas. Some worked, some didn't, but you cannot deny that he kept us on our toes with what Nintendo was going to do next. So one thing he said in that interview was that Nintendo wanted to surprise people with their next machines. They didn't want to make something that anyone could predict, like just a more powerful Game Boy Advance or just a more powerful GameCube. Right now though, it seems like the Switch 2 is going to be just a more powerful Switch, which is fine right now because the Switch is such a massive success. How could you not follow that up by releasing something that's simply a more powerful Switch? That said, that's something we all can predict. And you know, I've actually been saying this for a while to the disagreement of some, I like it when Nintendo gets weird. I like it when they go in and think outside the box on what a console could be, what kind of play styles are available that we don't even know about, and if Nintendo for the rest of their time in the industry ages eons to come, if all they ever did was make the Switch but more powerful, that's actually kind of boring to me. Not in the short term at all, but in the long, long, long term. A Switch 2 already sounds like an exciting endeavor, but what about a Switch 3 or a Switch 4 or even a Switch 7? Is, are people really going to still keep buying Switches in droves at that point? And we've seen in the past, whenever Nintendo releases a successor to their former console, like the Nintendo 64 and the GameCube, the Wii to Wii U, basically building upon those same ideas, they always sell worse than their predecessors, and I feel like the Switch 2 is going to go through the same fate. I don't think it'll sell much worse, like astronomically worse, but it definitely won't be the, like, the third best-selling game console of all time or anything. In the end, I hope Nintendo doesn't stray too far from the philosophies left by Satoru Iwata, that is making sure games feel great to play instead of just merely looking great, as well as surprising people with genuinely unique ideas. But yeah, going back to my original point, this 20-year-old interview is crazy, man. He really saw the future. You can't tell me otherwise. He looked at what PlayStation and Xbox were doing. He said, don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. Here's an idea. What if you could play games with this? It really shows that Awada had the foresight to know what would be best for Nintendo, especially from his own experience being a game developer. Simply making more powerful versions of the same consoles was not going to cut it in the long run. So as a result, the company came up with unique ideas, like the Wii, the Wii U, the Nintendo DS and 3DS. And in the end, they came up with the Nintendo Switch, which has brought them all kinds of success. Former Nintendo of America president Reggie fils said after Iwata died that it will be years before his impact on both Nintendo and the full video game industry will be fully appreciated. Well, after nine years, it seems that that time is now. So thank you to Adam Dory for sending us this interview. I encourage everyone to check it out because it just goes to show that Iwata was an influential figure in the gaming industry, not just because of what he did, but because I'm pretty sure he owned a crystal ball.